It's Waxing Miracle, baby. Hello, Waxers, and welcome to Waxing Lyrical with Mains and Dutts. I'm your host, Mains, and my colleague, who only came on this show as I said I'd resign after it, is Mr. Neil Dutton. How are we, Neil? Cutting edge satire there, Paul. Thank you. Just call me Amando Iannucci. Do you know what I mean? I'll call you something. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, I'm sure no one wants to get into the political process. But, Why um, was happening? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. But I bet you can't tell at what, what side me and Neil are on, given our accents and the fact that one of these political parties tried to destroy our country, destroy our, I'd say country, that was almost a Freudian slip, Republic um, slash city um, uh, 30 years ago. Exactly, Neil. So this week, after that bit of political satire, we have Weird World, as always. We're going to go through some NFL news, but main news is... We have the brilliant, the wonderful Mr. Adam Rank on the show this week, Neil. Back once again, like a renegade master. Neil trying to work out previously when was the last time we spoke to Adam on the show. And it was a very long time ago, considering he was a, a dad of singular kids at that that point, And now he's a dad of multiple. Indeed, he just had um, little Ahsoka Tano uh, rank, whereas now he has Wedge Antilles rank as well. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so we will speak to Adam uh, to close out the show. It was first things first, Neil. We're going to go Weird World. And ironically, totally ironically, the weird uh, is related to um, voting going wrong in some way, shape or form. And this is the title, Neil. Florida mayor arrested just weeks after taking over from Florida mayor who was arrested. Um, a second mayor... Yeah, assistant mayor has been arrested in Port Ritchie, Florida, 20 days after taking over for a previous mayor who had been arrested. Terence Rowe, 64, was arrested on charges of... Listen to this. This is, this is a long rap sheet, by the way. Obstruction of justice, conspiracy to commit obstruction of justice. So not only did he do it, he tried to do it again. And the use of a two-way communications device to facilitate the commission of a crime. I see that means he text someone but anyway um this was the second time in 20 days that a mayor had been arrested in, in the flood of the town the first being dale Nassad, 68 who was accused this is i like the way you have to use accused of firing a pasco sheriff swat team that was arresting him on allegations that he was practicing medicine without a license so he was practicing medicine without a license the swat team came to arrest him and he tried to fire them with a gun. Oh, sorry. You, you explained it badly. Um, firing at, not firing, firing at. off. Yeah, so that, that's even better. You know, we're, no, Mr. No, no, Your Honour, you, you can't disperse it. But no, put the gun down, Your Honour. Okay, you're going to have to come with us. I, I assume that, like in most towns, mayor is voted for in, in said, in said um, county. Was it county? Um, again, proving the point that I'm beginning to lose my patience with democracy as a concept. Well, bear in mind, those of us you know who had to sit through it, we do know that there is a TV show where one of the deputy mayors is a chicken. So, you know, the, 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 it would surpri- not surprise me in the least if, the, if Adventure Bay is actually set on a real place with a real deputy mayor who actually is poultry. Um, for those who aren't sure what Neil is talking about, he's talking about Paw Patrol, the uh, Disney Junior TV show. Deep down, I think that you know the, the subtext of most things I'm talking about is actually Paw Patrol. Although, actually, you know, um, bless them, my children have stopped watching Paw Patrol pretty much, except on uh, when when they watch Milkshake of a morning. Now they just want to watch Trolls. The and film? the no, they watch the film, but also they want to watch the the Netflix um, show Trolls. The beat goes on. Which, like all good kids' programs, has just enough lines in it that kids won't understand, but parents will. Have you? How many times have you watched the same episode, Neil? Well, there's there's 22 episodes, okay. um, and I'm up to at least the fourth go round on all of them. But I, I said my. I read today. I read a, a book to a, a story to Max every night. We have a multitude of books, pop the hundred. And he wants the five-minute Avengers stories, which I thought was cool originally, because then you get to read one. I read Spider-Man vs. the Sinister Six for possibly the hundredth time, and I would say the fifty-second time in the past, I don't know, 
80 days. Plus, there's not a chance in hell you could say Spider-Man The Sinister Six quickly and not get it wrong. Exactly, exactly. My favourite line, line, however, just uh, closing on the trolls, just in the, you know, it's it's for the parents because the kids will understand this. One of the characters eats a gingerbread version of themselves and then shouts, there can only be one. Now, there's no kid who knows what that's a reference to. No if, child. If, if they do, <laughs> that's a... That's a parent that needs a, probably a conversation with social care. Or a high five. Or a high five. Well, it depends. Um, as always, Neil, we love a weird world story. So if you've got one, send them over to us at waxing underscore lyrical or individually to at ndalton13. That's obviously Neil. And I am at mainzy7. Neil, we're going to do some bit of NFL news because there's been some big NFL news over the past week or so since we were here last time with the brilliant Nat Coombs and Mark Schofield. And the big news is um, everyone's favourite um, partying tight end buffoon, quote unquote, um, Rob Gronkowski, um, retiring. Um, original thoughts, Neil? He changed the position. You know, it's you know he he came into the league in two thousand and ten. Better man, Tom Brady has had before before Gronk. Uh, Tom Brady had had one true world-class performer <clears throat> excuse me, at his disposal, and it was Randy Moss. Moss was just starting to, I'll be blind, piss Belichick off in 2010. Plus, Belichick's always been fascinated by tight ends, so he thought, well, tell you what, this is a good crop for him. Let's not just take one, let's take two. And the one he took first was Rob Gronkowski, who hadn't played for a year in college because he was, uh, he was injured, and he dropped out the first round because people were concerned he wouldn't last long. I just want to say that the first tight end taken in the 2010 draft was Jermaine Gresham. Yeah. Been more injured than Gronk. Yeah, (laughs) been more injured than Gronk. Let's just remember that. Gronk has changed the way the tight end position has been played because he was genuinely good at both areas. He was a wonderful blocker and obviously is a fantastic receiver. Anyone, no one else is in his class at being excellent at both of them. And, you know, unfortunately for many years, you know, at the fancy fancy football angle, it was, if you don't get Gronk, you're going to have to stream it. Now it's a bit better. There's a few more contributors at the top. But no one is as dominant as Rob Gronkowski was at his peak. He looked old and slow last year. And I know he had various, various you know, times he wasn't fit and healthy. But do we really think him playing one of the most physically demanding positions in the most physically demanding sport, that he was all of a sudden going to get healthy again? No, don't be stupid. He's going out on his terms as everyone knew and hoped he would do. The irony for me is that he'll get into the Hall of Fame before Brady because Brady will never retire, so he can never get into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, most receiving yards, most receiving touchdowns from Tom Brady, Dion Branch, 24, Julian Edelman, 30, Wes Welker, 34, Randy Moss, you may have heard of him, 39. Rob Gronkowski, 78. I have a couple of things to say on Gronk. One, I look forward to watching him with my WWE Network subscription and saying, God, this guy can't wrestle. Um, But he's a champ because, you know, it's scripted, breaking news, um, and he'll make a load of money. As I said, he retired on, like, Friday, on Monday, in Boston, a dude was already calling them out. If you can't read the tea leaves, can't help you. The other thing is, it's a, I guess it's an open, an open letter to fans of the NFL, especially Cowboys fans. Um, don't come up in my Twitter feed slash ears with this absolute nonsense about Jason Witten being a better tight end than Rob Gronkowski. I don't want to hear it ever, ever again. It's not that I don't want to hear it. It's the fact that it's bollocks. Well, it's it's bo- that's why I don't want to hear it, Neil. Mm. You know, I think he's the most dominant tight end ever. I'm happy to have discussions on some players and then prove that I am right. That's fine. I'm just said that I've already had that discussion on J- Jason Witten and you're wrong. Um, because I can remember. I've not, I've not seen... I've seen tight ends obviously be big parts of the game plan. Jason Witten, obviously for a large portion of Tony Romo's career, was his go-to guy. I have never seen Jason Witten take over a game 
like Rob Gronkowski did in the 2015 AFC title game against the Broncos, and also in the second half of the Super Bowl against the Eagles, because they ignored him in the first half. It's just like, oh, Gronk can't be right. But then literally it was, all right, boys, fags out, get it to Gronk. Because I don't know if anyone's noticed, I know the Eagles won the Super Bowl, which I do like to remind people of, because, you know, a bit of water under the bridge. (laughs) Gronk and Brady in that second half made damn sure it wasn't going to be easy. Absolutely. Jason Witten ain't doing that, and he never did it in his pump. And he's a wonderful player, Neil. I'm not not denying that Jason Witten was a wonderful player. I am aware of his wonderfulness. He played against us. Do you know what I mean? I'm aware of it. I'm just saying Mm. that, for me, over the past multitude of years, Gronk's the best I've ever seen. As you said... You've now the last three or four years. You've now got out of that situation of do I pick Gronk under the impression that I win those six to seven, eight games that I'm guaranteed he's going to play. He could play sixteen and I could dominate my fantasy league. I don't have to have that in my life anymore. And that's a good thing. Well, yeah. Um. Now, now for the um, now for the uh, Patriots conspiracy part of the show. Um, opening day game, Neil. This this on Thursday night footy is Packers v Bears. Um, a couple of things on that. Um, we haven't always had the Super Bowl champs start the season. That's a new phenomenon. Um, more people watch Sunday night football than Thursday night football. Um, also, it's practically accurate. And uh, the Packers versus the Bears, I don't know if you've heard, is a big game and has been for basically the 100 years of the existence of the NFL, which they will be celebrating on opening day. It is a good way to celebrate the 100 year because, as I say, it's the oldest rivalry in the NFL because they obviously they're still in the same division. They play it every year. One, I don't like all divisional matchups in week one. So while I don't I don't argue that, you know, if you're going to have one, that's fine. But to do us a favour, don't make it. A, don't go across the slate. Don't decide, OK, if we're going to do it for one, we may as well go all division week one because you already do it all division week 17. When you know it's it's got a bit of meaning. It's as I think it's what the, uh, Damashek says. We've been waiting for football since the end of January, beginning of February. We will watch anything. Don't make it divisional games that matter. Don't get them out the way first. Give oh, us the crap. Oh Neil, there's the uh, Sunday night football will be three. The choice of three games. It will either be Pats play the Browns. mm Hmm. Pats play the Chiefs, or ratings gold, Pats play the Cowboys. Oh, God. I forgot it was East v. East this year. So there's a high possibility that that's the game, and that will be the biggest game of the year, regardless of the fact of whether you think Dallas are any good. Yeah. It's as you say, if if the Rams had won the Super Bowl and they decided the Rams aren't going to be the season opener, no one would care. But this is no the, one would care. But this is the tinfoil hat section of the show, Neil. Uh, yeah. Patriots, Patriots Conspiracy Hour. So, obviously, it's a big deal. Final thing, Neil. I was going to talk about replay changes. I'm not going to now. What I'm going to do is I want I want you to discuss your flip-flop on your love of Sean Payton, please. Sean Payton has basically, you know, has, you know, has, has cast aside all doubts I had on him as a person by acknowledging... That something that Matt Money Smith said to me many years ago, you know, he also said, Neil, don't name drop. But he, he did say, fantasy football is bigger than the game of American football because it get it's an in, it's a way in, it's a way to learn about the game. It's how I learned about the game. It's how most people do. Some fantasy analysts are among the most well read, cleverest most insightful analysts about this game. And most of them do it because of numbers. Because of fantasy football is a game of numbers. Obviously, the American football is loads of fellas going and beating the crap out of each other. But more and more teams are embracing metrics, and metrics mean numbers. Sean Payton has come out and said, fantasy football is great for us because now everyone has got skin in the game. Yes, Sean, that is correct. I wonder, however, if you'd taken this stance if you didn't have a QB1, an RB1 and a WR1. If you didn't have all of these players, if you had, you know, I don't, you know I, Ryan Tannehill, you know, Travis Cadet and Ted Ginn. If they were your playmakers, would you be in this? But he's not. He knew, he knew how to get the geeks on his side. And I am now firmly, 
not as opposed to Sean Payton as I was six or seven weeks ago. <laughs> Excellent, Neil. Excellent. Well, that's that's the news portion of the show. I'm sure we'll come on to the replays in the coming weeks. But now it's time to get on. One of the original guests and one of our favourites, Mr. Adam Rank. We're going to talk about multiple things, including which is which has made him happier, all his kids or Mike Trout. And joining us now on Wax and Lyrical, a man that needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. It's the wonderful, the fantastic Mr. Adam Rank. Adam, how are we today? Oh, thank you so much. That Again, a, a wonderful introduction and as always... A pleasure to be on with both of you, even though it has been far too long. Yeah, we, we were trying to work out how long it was, and that is too long. Um, we're going to get straight into it because we got there's a lot of news that we want to discuss with you, but I think knowing your love of a certain baseball team, there's only one news which, you, which we should start with, <laughs> and that is how would you spend a hundred and forty, sorry, four hundred million dollars over twelve years? You know, I might be able to pay off my student loans, but I don't know if that's the case. This is America, and they don't want you to get underneath from a, that debt. They want to they want to continue to hold on. I might be, you know, I probably wouldn't be upside down in my mortgage anymore. Uh, you know what? I'm still paying off a Vegas vendor from like 15 years ago because I spent the evening buying Jaeger bombs for a girl I'm pretty sure was Trishel from the real world Las Vegas. So there's a lot of things I would have to go and put my money into. So it's one of those things that it's, it's unfathomable because he's even like, you know, cause we get, we get meager compared to what Mike Trout's getting. We get, we get modest little bonuses from our work and I don't know what to do with I'm like, Oh my God, I, I'm such a hoarder. It's like when you get a gift card, like gift cards are awesome. Like I really appreciate them, but I have a, I have a stack of gift cards because I always have to sit there and, and wonder like, is this really, is this purchase gift card worthy? Like, I got to make sure I'm like, is it? I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. This is a cool shirt. I really like it. But is it is it gift card good? And then, you know, that would be that's how I would be able to like if somebody wanted me to stop spending money forever, just pay me in gift cards and I would hoard it. Do, do we think do we think that this is a obviously it's great news for the for the angels. It's it's great news for anybody who doesn't like the Phillies. Um, <laughs> so are we? With with this cost certainty for the Angels, are we assuming this is the start of something um, in the in the uh, AL West? Absolutely. You know this this team ever since they got rid of. I, I still I was on a, I was doing my podcast earlier today. I cannot remember the former general manager's name, but once Billy Epler, who's the current GM, took over, he he understood that the farm system was not great, and I had always kind of felt that even though the Angels have tried to surround Mike Trout with as much talent as possible, of course, the Albert Pujols deal will be something that's debated for a long time, whether that was worth it or not. Josh Hamilton wasn't probably worth it. C.J. Wilson was not worth it. You know, But they've tried to make moves. They've tried to acquire, or they did acquire, Justin Upton at the, at the trade deadline a couple of years ago. They got Otani last year. So they've, in addition to trying to get major league talent around him, They've also built up the farm system, and they do that by instead of drafting college players exclusively, which the previous read, I can see that guy's face, but I can't think of his name. They were doing, they were drafting too many college players. Now it's cool for college pitchers, but Epler started drafting these younger guys like Joe Adele, who's going to be in the major league level next year, and finding guys like that so that they have depth and they become a, a team like the Astros, who built up the right way. And the bonus for the Angels is that they've got the best player in baseball in center field already. So it's a pretty nice piece to build around. So it's going to be the future's pretty good in Anaheim. So I'm just thinking back, you know, what you said before about these things being are they worth spending gifts gift monies on? And yeah. as I say, I, I I'm, I'm I'm the same. So, you know, if you give me a gift card. It's going to be like, this will be great until I actually come to spend it. And it's just like, <laughs> I, I don't need this. It's, you know, I, I, really, I mean, it's deodorant. You know, and ultimately, is that really what they, they, they want me to spend this on? It, it's Jerry yeah, the, yeah. It's, it's Jerry Poto, by the way, Adam. There, oh, my gosh. I literally could not think of it. I wasn't even, it's not a bit. It wasn't an axe. I, I would know the guy if I saw him face to face. And I'm like, why can I not think of it? And he's the man, he's the GM of the Mariners. It's not like he's been out of my life forever, but he was, 
he was a little too smug for my taste. And Billy Epler, once he came over from the Yankees, and you know, he was part of the Yankees team that built up a nice core nucleus. I mean, it's it's very similar. Like you look at some of the players on the Yankees roster right now. They've got a lot of great homegrown talent, including Aaron Judge, uh, the shortstop, Didi Gregarious, and all those guys. They've done a nice job, even with some of the – Gary Sanchez was another one too. Like they've done a nice job of building a strong nucleus, but still have the financial resources to go out and get a Giancarlo Stanton. And the Angels have put themselves in a similar type position because even though Trout's the highest played pl- highest paid player in baseball, they haven't – financially crippled themselves that prevent them from going out and making other moves. We move back to topics that I actually know a damn thing about. <laughs> um, um, obviously big news this week, Adam, you know, um, you may have, you may have heard about it. You know, I, I'm not, not sure how, 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 you know, in touch you're keeping with the, you know, the sport. Um, Rob Gronkowski, uh, obviously <laughs> retired. <laughs> um, from, from one maverick to another, why are people debating that he wasn't the greatest tight end we've ever seen? You know, this is hilarious to me because that news came out Sunday night. Funny enough, I was at an Angels game, the, the freeway series with the Dodgers, when the my phone started blowing up. And as I'm sitting there, and it's funny because I'm not clouded by other people's snap opinions on Twitter or anything. I'm there spending time with my daughter watching a baseball game. And my first thought is, is Rob Gronkowski the greatest tight end of all time? And, you know, obviously there's going to be some names like Tony Gonzalez, Shannon Sharp, Dave Casper, Mike Digga, like a lot of great tight ends in NFL history. You know, where does Rob Gronkowski kind of fit with those players? I'm like, I thought that was going to be the debate, the debate of, is he the greatest of all time? I didn't realize that idiots were coming out and being like, is this guy going to be in the hall? Like, is he, he's not going to be like, I don't, I don't. I feel as a society in general, we have to have some basic truths. Like we have to be able to come together as a people and be like, listen, we need water to survive. We need this. We need like we need to have these basic fundamental agreements and then we can go out and try to work on our differences. But if our base point of like whether you dis- whether you understand if Gronkowski is a Hall of Famer or not, if we're disagreeing on that, we have way too many other issues because to me, of anybody who's watched football for the last 10, 15, 20 years has to realize that you were watching one of the greatest at their position. And for me, I thought he was the greatest. So it's it's an amusing it's amusing that that was the conversation. I looked at that, Adam, and I was the same. And I'm like, if he isn't a Hall of Famer, like, who is? You know, it's, it's like the kind of, I'm, I'm comfortable if you're going to say he's not. Okay, but I totally and utterly disagree with you. But if he isn't an all, a Hall of Famer, then the guy with the most touchdowns and yards and, you know, a great... What, what is your remit for for being a, a, a Hall of Famer? It sounds completely bizarre to me. Yes, it, it really is a little bit baffling to me. I thought, you know, I thought, for instance, Jason Witten, to me, seemed like a borderline type like, I will have that argument. Like, that seems kind of right. But Gronk was so dominant, and he was the best. And I understand that there's questions about his availability and everything like that. And I don't know if this this analogy will translate across the pond, but it's kind of like going to McDonald's, where the Big Mac, let's say Tony Gonzalez is the Big Mac, always on the menu, always know that it's going to be good. Gronk was like the McRib. Like, he's not always on the menu. But when he's there, that's absolutely what you're ordering. I, I, it's that it's that thing of that. For most people, that doesn't translate. Apart from the fact that I listen to far too much American radio, so as soon as you start that <laughs> analogy, I was like, he's going to say McRib. He's absolutely going to say McRib right McRib. now. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what the what the English equivalent would be. And I apologize. I should have done my research. This is. I need to know my audience a little better, and this is why my. My European tour has been stalled. I need to come up. And if you, and honestly, if you guys, you know, and I know that I'm assuming, I obviously Neil and I follow it. We follow each other too, right? I hope not. Make sure that that's rectified. But, you know, DM me like this is the joke you should have gone for. And that way, if I'm ever, you know, on Colin's podcast or something, then I can go out and have, you know, then I can seem like I know what I'm talking about. Um. Onto speaking of jokes, team. speaking of jokes, yeah. Onto another team. Um, 
we we've we've asked this question to ourselves. We've asked it to a couple of friends, and we haven't really got an answer. So we're going to ask you: Have you got any idea what the New York Giants are doing? I I kind of get it. I, I it's fun. I you know I'm I want to make jokes in the moment, so I want to come out and 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 pan Dave Gettleman and do all that stuff because it's fun. Like I'm a I'm a jerk, so I'm going to sit there and I want to make jokes and 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 play along with everybody and just have a good time. I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt and to, hey, oh, I'm willing to get, I'm sure somebody, somebody, who's, somebody who's listening to this is going to be like, what did he see? <laughs> I saw one of the most darling little girls walk by the screen. And so I, I think what Gettleman might be doing is setting himself up to perhaps get his quarterback of the future in the draft, perhaps address some other needs. And it seems weird in the moment. And right now it seems absolutely one-sided. I mean, I, I made the joke that, hey, Dave Gettleman's out there building a championship team in Cleveland, not New York. But he's still, he's building a championship team and he does need some credit for that. And I look at it and let's say, let's say something crazy happens. Let's say they end up with Tyler Murray and let's say they end up with Nikhil Harry or somebody like that. And if they can go out and get production with those draft picks, then it might end up looking like, hey, that wasn't the worst deal. Even if OBJ goes out and does what he does, he does OBJ things in Cleveland and he has a lot of success. If the Giants can find some success with their picks, then it won't work out. In the immediacy, an F. Awful, terrible PR hit. But you know what? There's some opportunities as, as soon as the draft to get some guys in there. And I... I'm going to trust that he has a plan, but that's not going to stop me from making my jokes. It's as I say, it's if it is a plan, you know, it's it was one of those. I think it was after Winston Churchill lost a general election, his wife said to him, This could be a blessing in disguise. And Winston responded with, You know, if that's the case, it's a bloody good disguise. I think that's the case yeah. of this. You know, if he has got a plan, it must be a ridiculously cunning one because right now it looks crap. Yeah, you know what? But you could have been watching Ocean's Eleven and be like, there's no way they're getting that money out of that vault. And then all of a sudden, Terry Benedict's sitting there realizing, wait, my own guys took the money out of the vault themselves. And they're shooting up a plane at McCarran Airport filled with porn flyers. So who knows? This is this could be an elaborate, elaborate ruse. And we we could end up, you know, being the the, the butt of the joke at the end of this. So I don't think so. I mean, Gettleman, you know, it's not like he was a championship builder down in Carolina. They had some good teams and did well, but it's not like he's had the track record where he's done it, done it at other places. You know, I, if I can give a, an NBA example, and again, I know I'm going to lose Neil here, but Jerry West is this ace general manager in the NBA. He was, he was the architect of the Lakers, great teams of the eighties, all the way through the Kobe Shaq era goes to golden state. Now that's the best team in the NBA for the last five, 10 years. And now he's with the Clippers and he made all these moves that people are like, what is this guy doing? And I remember thinking in the moments like it's Jerry West. Like he's built up enough equity that I'm, I'm not going to say a word. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not a Clippers fan, so I'm not going to make fun of him. I'll be like, yeah, you guys are I never. And then this year they're going to get the number three seed in the, in the West. And you're like with players that nobody's ever heard of. And you're like, yeah, this is, People like that have built that kind of equity and trust. Gettleman has not yet, but I'm still willing, at least through the draft, to give him the benefit of the doubt. Neil, just well, to, just to give you an example. So if you don't know who Jerry West is, Google NBA logo, and you'll see a, pit, a silhouette of the NBA logo. And that NBA logo is, in fact, Jerry West, who was... As a player? As a player. So not only, as, he, as Adam quite rightly points out, created two dynasties or multiple dynasties in the Lakers and then one in Golden State. Now done miracles in Los Angeles with the Clippers. He also was an amazing player for the Lakers. In fact, I think is the only player to ever win a finals MVP while losing said finals. So he's yeah. someone who's someone whose opinion can be trusted. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, mate. Exactly. It'd be a bit like, you know, Adam won't know this as well. If if Craig or Gaz says was this chocolate bar this is chocolate nice, bar. yeah. If I don't agree, exactly. I'm wrong. Then you're wrong. Absolutely. They've, Absolutely. They've you built up it. the equity. They, they know what they're talking about. Correct. Um, obviously, as we say that you know, uh, Gettleman, you know, the world's worst superhero, you know, the Gettleman. 
um, is building a championship team in Cleveland by breaking up his New York Giants team. Speaking as, you know, from a team that did break up, obviously the last time we spoke, and obviously a lot of water has been gone under the bridge since then, the fantasy stronghold that was the NFL Fantasy Live podcast has come, been built, and been broken and gone again. I just wonder, you know, how what was it like as... Because obviously the NFL, we've got the around the, the the NFL podcast with that team. The pod, the Fancy Live podcast was on a par with it, on, you know, on its day. I just wonder, you know, what was it like working with, you know, James, Marcus, Alex, and boy, young boy, Matt Harmon? To be honest, I, I never cared for him. I wasn't, <laughs> I was never, you know, it didn't really bother me. No, it was... Yeah, it was like watching. It's funny because I just watched the Netflix original movie of the Dirt of the 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 Holly the 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 movie based on the movie. The wait, hold on, the movie based on the book of Motley Crue and how they went through the the try and how they broke up and things that happened and things that frayed and and sometimes when you go through a breakup like that with a group that just leaves together it's it's usually like bad terms but this was a, a group of individuals who absolutely loved each other and loved hanging out loved everybody's company and as recently as last week alex gelhar who left to go pursue a a degree in law he returned obviously i was i was out i was out of town unfortunately but he returned and then you know james co and, and Harmon and franchise and everybody got back you know for one night or a couple of nights and had some fun and had some laughs and reminisced and it, it just made you realize how special of a, of a crew that was. And I remember something that the Andrew Bernard said from the American version of The Office. And I got to be honest with you, I will most of the time tip my hat to England's TV. The American version of The Office was bad. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to be that one who says it. I, I love Ricky Gervais, but Steve Carell knocked it out of the park. Anyways, he said sometimes – you miss the good times, but you wish you could know that you were in the good times. And one of the things about working with all those guys is that you knew that we were in the good times and you knew there was something special going on. And I know that as somebody who's been with the NFL since I was in college, starting as an intern with the publishing group and then moving over to fantasy and watching the fantasy department grow from one person to a team. And you think of you know, all the great fantasy writers. Uh, and a lot of times when you have a league owned entity like NFL.com or NBA.com or whether it's MLB.com, you always look at like independent sources like the athletic or ESPN or anything like that as being like, that's where you go to. But I thought that thanks to Alex and those guys that we had really built something to where NFL.com fantasy was a destination was becoming one of the most respected voices in the industry. And so I did have the wherewithal to recognize that we are in a special time. And when it started to become, when you started to see it unravel, not unravel like poorly, but when you started to see that, well, somebody's going here and somebody's going there, it's kind of like when you were watching Rogue One and you're watching that movie and you're, you go into the movie thinking like, how are they going to explain how, where these characters have been and for episodes four, five, six, and seven. And then you sit there and you're like, Oh wait, everybody's going to die. This is <laughs> this is troubling. And as you saw it, you know, and and Harmon, I think it started with franchise going to EA and then Harmon's off to Yahoo and we kind of knew that Alex was going to go to law school and then James had other opportunities that he started going after and you're like, "Oh my gosh, this is depressing." Thankfully, Marcus signed a contract, so I'm like, "I'm not losing all of my friends." So, it was really like a special group and I know that you you talked about the around the NFL guys. And I, I have the utmost respect for them. And I also have a tinge of jealousy of the four of those guys, just being able to just be a crew forever. There was been, there's been no heel turns. There's been no Ole Anderson swapped out for Barry Windham or anything like that. It's been four guys who've been together. It seems like a decade at least. And they do such a great job and they've built such a great fan base, especially in the UK. So there's, there's a little bit of jealousy on my part. So it's uh, it was a fun time to be a part of the stronghold, but you know what, the stronghold lives forever. So speaking of factions and stables, Adam has dropped in a bit of bit of uh, four horsemen knowledge for everyone there. Um, the last time we spoke was so long ago that me and Neil believe you only had one child. 
I guess yeah. our question our question is as as we are both uh, fathers of multiple children um, is how is the how is the world of multiple kids uh, took you have you enjoyed it has it become a challenge have you noticed that they gang up on you i've got three boys i've noticed that greatly and um, you you seem to become the odd one out the, it, some kind of democracy breaks out and they're in charge and you don't know how that's happened so how has it gone for you with multiple kids in the, in the rank household well we the boy is young still so he's seven months old so he hasn't really become a con- conspirator with his sister yet Obviously, that is going to be something that's going to happen a, a little bit down the line. The way it's kind of broken out right now, it's kind of like being in the big brother house. And I actually, my daughter and I, we have a final two agreement. And my wife and my son have a final two agreement. So we're kind of, we're, we kind of face it that way. That's the way it's been. That's kind of the dynamic that it's worked out to. So, cause you know, the boy's still not quite old enough to go to baseball games and do stuff like that. So it's easier for me to, especially, you know, when you have a, toddler who's running around you you sometimes have to scoop her out of there just for her own safety like you're you know because they act like three-year-olds and you're like i gotta make sure that you're doing the right you know stop driving your mom crazy let's go outside and have some fun but it's it's a fun it's a fun dynamic but it is a little bit challenging because i thought i, I remember a lot of people saying that oh you know when, when you hear about people going from a situation like you going from two to three, you're like, well, you go from man to man to zone defense because you and your wife are now outnumbered. But it's really different because when you have that two on one with one child, like you're in such a dominant position and it's so much easier to be like, hey, can you just watch this one child? But now you're trying to like, can somebody watch two? Now you have to, somebody's always got to have a kid. And so now you're like, we, we might as well have six. Like it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't. What's the difference going to be? Because we are our time's done anyways. So, but it is a lot of fun, and I'm enjoying it, and we're excited for the boy. He's he's standing now, and it's not going to be long before he's he's going to walk, and then he's going to be out running around, and so it'll be a good time. So we are enjoying it, but it is yeah, it's a lot different. You you mentioned You've... something today. You just mentioned something and nothing that a friend of ours mentioned yesterday as we ra- as we uh, shared the tweet. That, uh, congratulating uh, Phil Rivers on his ninth child, and as my <laughs> friend said, at that number, you may as well have as many as you need because there's no, you've lost total control of the world. At, like probably have four or five, so he's just thought, well, well, if, I have, if I've got five, I may as well have fifteen. Yeah, I mean, what's what's the difference? Because especially the older ones, like even if you were having them ten mar- ten months apart from each other. There's still a nine year gap from the oldest to the youngest, but now you're to the point. I don't know how old his oldest is, but that's the babysitter. Like, like, yeah, you're in charge. Like, you might as like you're. It's really up to the oldest kid. Like, how many would you be able to handle? Like, we're <laughs> gonna have to start passing off some of these duties and some of these responsibilities to you. And I know you didn't sign up for this, but you know your mom and I can't keep our hands off each other. So this is the situation that you're in now. Have you found, Adam, um, this has happened to me countless times, um, when you've been looking after the the kids, if they've been watching the telly, once they've gone to bed, you find yourself for about another hour afterwards still watching the programme they were watching? Why am I still watching Peppa Pig? Exactly. That's the one. You're like, oh, I could be watching something else. Yeah, that's that's a big one. That's the one. Like, why is this still on? Vampirina, like all those. Like, it's... The only reason I'm watching it is because you go... I've seen this one. It's not the, why am I watching Peppa Pig? It's the, no, I saw this one yesterday. Uh, this is the one where they go to the potato park. Like, I've seen this one. And, of course, it, it's going to end poorly. But, you know, the good thing, though, is is having a, a daughter, and this is a legitimate, she legitimately likes baseball. And you probably saw it on a Facebook post the other night that my wife was upstairs nursing the boy, getting ready to put him down, and my daughter's negotiating extended extended time to stay up she's like no i'm watching the baseball game and she knows that if she pulls out that card that i'm not going to be the person who says like oh no you're done then it's the mother you got to trick them you know you either you know we we actually do record them like okay we'll record it you can watch it in the morning and she'll legitimately watch it in the morning as a matter of fact for a lot of the off season we had recorded the ninth inning of an angels dodgers game 
and it was an it was an amazing rally. The Angels were down to their last strike in the bottom of the ninth inning and somehow rallied to win improbably. So we kept that, and she loved watching it during the off season. She'd wake up, she'd be you know she'd see Peppa Pig, but she would see the Angels logo on the DVR and be like, "Oh, baseball!" So unfortunately, she. I think she believes the Angels won the World Series last year because every time she watched, they won in incredible fashion. It's a lot. It is a lot of fun. But yeah, so we we catch a little bit of a break now that baseball season's back. That perhaps we won't have the Peppa Pig on late at night. And the final question we've got for you, Adam. You, you did mention it before that you uh, recorded your podcast uh, today. Um, obviously, the Adam Rank podcast. Um, fa- Good, good job on the title. You know, it's it, it must you. have it must have taken a lot of a lot of thought. Yeah. Um, you know what? Listen, you. <laughs> I know you're joking about that, but it's it. It was an old marketing lesson when I used to. There was a time where I wasn't working. It was a brief period where I was actually I was working side work doing. I was doing writing about restaurant and believe it, hotel development. A lot of the hotel hotel development writing was about Las Vegas, which was the happening market at the time. And Steve Wynn, who's kind of a d bag, so this is I'm not using I'm I'm not using him as a shining example, but it's a marketing example. Is that he was going to build a casino called the Rev, and then somebody told him, you know, in Las Vegas at the time, there is no bigger brand than your own name. So that was why Mr. Smarty Pants. Making your jokes. Listen, have have your jokes, Neil. I don't want to take that from you. Again, like I said about Gettleman, like I'll continue to make my jokes. And I, I let you. I let you have your bats. But for the kids listening, sometimes when your name is the, the biggest part of your brand, you go with that. And it's easier to find. And plus, my first name starts with an A, so it's always listed near the top. So that's a mistake we've made, obviously, with the, the W waxing lyrical. And it doesn't have our name in Yeah, exactly. Right. No. Um, Obviously, Adam, one of the big differences, I mean, while Mainzy may think he, he spends 45 minutes a week doing this by himself, you actually are podding by yourself. How how difficult is that to do? Because we've had very few occasions where one of us have had to pod by ourselves. And just speaking my own point of view, you think you've been talking for ages and you look at the clock and you've been on two minutes and you're like, I really can't stop this now at two minutes. I have to keep going. Yeah, I understand what that means. I know when I was first starting stand-up comedy, is you'd be like, "Oh, you'd see the clock," you'd be like, "I've got, I've got an hour's worth of material," and then three minutes in, you're like, "Yeah, I'm done with every joke." I'm ha-. then you're turning to everything. So where are you from? Did you yeah, did you fly in by any chance? You know, and you're going through that. But after repetition and everything, you start to become accustomed to it. And as you said, a lot of times I do it by myself. I do like to bring in some people who wrangle questions and can kind of act as a producer and I can bounce things off here and there. I just, you know, I, I'm, I think very highly of myself. So I just want to sit here and listen to myself go on and on. You can tell from my answers, like I have no shortage of BS or, or dumb analogies to, to go through. So I, I always have a lot of that and I probably will end up repeating myself sometimes too, but you know, I just, it's a mindset, you know, whenever you're, However, your dynamic is set up. I'm sure that if you started doing it on the reg, you would you would find it a lot easier. And there's times, believe it or not, where I have to cut myself off. I'm like an hour in. I'm like, well, I have to go. There were 13 other things I wanted to get because I see me. Uh, you can also tell that I have an opinion on everything because that's me. So you know how that goes. You know, my family originally is from Ireland, so you know, that, so it fits. You know, we have an opinion on absolutely everything and got to go through things like that. So it's a lot of fun too. And I do like making fun of, I used to always make fun of the stronghold. I'm like, you guys need five dudes and it's just me, but whatever you guys do you and enjoy all of that stuff. And so, and by the way, if you've listened to any of this and thought that I was a delight, which is highly unlikely. And you're like, I'm going to go listen to this pod. I've pretty much said everything on the pod. I've repeated it here. So (laughs) save it. And then the worst part is next week, it's going to be a a WrestleMania podcast. So there'll be nary any football men. And it's it's the the annual edition of something that people hate so much because I live stream it when we record it. And then I warn everybody. I warn everybody the week before. So today's I'm like, hey, next week it's WrestleMania. If you don't like wrestling, don't 
don't download or download it, but you don't have to listen. I start the show with two minutes of football and let everybody know we're not talking football. This is going to be all wrestling. I think I've even lined up a couple of wrestling guests. And invariably, 15 minutes in, people are like, are you only going to talk wrestling? And like, yeah, that's one time a year. One time a year. Give me that. So, so yeah, so you can tell by this answer. I do like talking a lot. That's true. So to be fair, I, I think if we if we had guests who didn't like talking, it would be that would it would be, be great. Bad. No, that would be that would be bad. So we are made up that Adam <laughs> Adam gets to talk. I am interested to find out his thoughts now on what happens in the women's main event. Now that Charlotte's got the, the SmackDown women's title, I'm interested what he thinks on Kofi versus Daniel Bryan. I'm interested in whether we finally see the back of Brock Lesnar, but you'll have to wait for Adam's show next week for all of those oh. things. <laughs> Because I've got to pick, because I've got to pick up my son in 15 minutes, and I know that response will take an hour and a half. Of course, yeah, you, you're you're probably right. Because I have a lot of thoughts. Because Oscar is one of my favorite wrestlers, and then obviously for Charlotte Fair to hold the SmackDown Women's Title means that Oscar is no longer the champion, which is upsetting to me. And I would go on and on about that. So I will, I will let you all off the hook. As always, Adam, it's brilliant to speak to you. And let's let's make it a shorter time next time before we speak again. Please, because as always, the pleasure was all on this side of the phone, and it was great. And this is cool. Like, I know a lot of people, this is too inside baseball for everybody, or a lot of my references are too. But getting to see you guys on video this is, a, is such a delight. It's so much easier. And I think that actually helps talk forever, because I, I do like looking people in the eyes and lecturing them. That in addition to having all these opinions, I really like lecturing people. So that's one of my things. So this has worked out perfectly for me. You guys, not so much. But for me, absolutely. Cheers, Adam. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Let's talk soon. Well, Neil, that was a brilliant Adam rank. I don't know what I enjoyed more, getting to speak to Adam or the 75% of our conversation you had absolutely zero clue about. See, this is the problem. Um, you know, I, I come up with the question themes, um, and I really should have thought it through. That you know, if I actually wanted to have any part of the conversation, I really should have worked it better. However, it's as I say, we we get people on because we want to hear them talk, and we want to hear them talk about subjects that they know about, that they're knowledgeable about, and that they can educate on us. Spoiler alert, by the way, it was my eldest daughter Zoe who walked past the screen. That was what Adam was uh, referencing. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, Neil, 48 minutes, so we're going to let everyone go. Um, where can people catch you on the interweb this week? This week I have, on number five, I've written an article about the fantasy football impact for the New England Patriots uh, after the retirement of Rob Gronkowski. For Rotoviz, I've written an article on the best of what's left in free agency. And the second it was published, James Jones tweets that Jordy Nelson has retired. So thanks, Jimmy. Really appreciate that. And also for player profiler, Roto Underworld, I have written a piece about vacated targets and about some of the teams who an awful lot of their targets from last season are no longer on the roster and how they'll look to fill them. So quite a busy week this week. I've put some what I think is good content out there Please go check it out, enjoy it, and follow me if you don't on the Twitter at endup 13 I am at Mandy7. Um, less, less content related to um, articles on the NFL at the moment. Time is took up with politics and Liverpool Football Club. Um, Neil, as always, great speaking to you. And these Was top it? guys... Well, I'm going to say it is. It's more more of a privilege speaking to Adam. I look forward to his five-hour discussion on WrestleMania 35 on his podcast next week. On that note, and in a tip of the hat, Neil wouldn't know, these top guys are out.